Welcome to Hill Street Church of Christ this morning. I'm glad to have everyone here. Uh, appreciate your presence today. Special welcome to Hartley and Cole Sutherland's family. You brought a whole house full back there. It's nice to see that those two rows full. Man, you got a lot of family. <laughs> Good looking family too. So we really appreciate you guys being here. Um, the order of service today is uh, Brian's going to have her singing for us. Uh, Layton's going to do the reading. I'll have the prayer. Scott's going to speak. And then uh, Lance will have the Lord's Supper assisted by Eddie and probably late. And then uh, we're going to save all the rest of these announcements. There's not a whole lot in here, but we'll save them until the end of the service. And uh, we'll open with a word of prayer. And Lance, would you open us with a word of prayer? And then we'll begin our song service with Brian. Well, stand, if you will, for open prayer. Father, we come before you this morning to thank you for the night's rest. We thank you for this beautiful new day that you blessed us with and this opportunity that we have to be here to, to share time with other Christians and to study from your word and sing praises to you. Father, we pray that we conduct ourselves here in a manner that is well-pleasing to you. We ask that we live our lives for you. We ask that you forgive us and save us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Number 63, the first song, number 63. I will call upon the Lord. Yonder in glory when the crown is won, is won. For 
Jesus is now the star divine, brighter and brighter he will shine. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on, shine on. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful star of Bethlehem, star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory, glory dawns. Oh, give us the light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on, shine on. 134 <coughs> 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 Oh, my grace, how great I dare 
open by my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I fear. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. The reading this morning will come from Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together. O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning to, in thanksgiving, to be thinking about you this morning, to be thinking about your kingdom and what you've done for us. We're so thankful for all the blessings of this life and your plan of salvation that you have set before us, Father, if we will follow your, follow your will. Father, we ask that each day that we live, we let our light shine as you ask us to do and to be the salt of this earth, that we might be a sweet-smelling savor to you. Father, that we might lead others by our example and by the lives that we live and by the way that other people see us, that they can see that there's something different about us, that, Father, that they might want to be a part of the same thing that we have, and, and that's the love of Christ. Father, we are so grateful for the, uh, the things that we take for granted each day, just our voices and being able to sing and the, uh, our health. Father, we take that for granted every day that we live, and we know, Father, that these things can be taken from us any time and that we can lose <coughs> parts of our body that, and, and parts of our mind and our soul and, and our we can lose a lot of things, Father, and we, we are so grateful for everything that you've given us because we know, Father, that when we miss one finger or get one cut or one little problem goes wrong in our life or in our, with our body that we, we uh, struggle and we realize how important those things are to us when we don't have them. We're grateful, Father, for uh, your son Jesus who died on the cross for us. We do not take that for granted, and we are forever grateful, and we're in debt to you for from now to the end of time, we're thankful, Father, for that you gave up your life, a life without sin, and you suffered and bled for us and died for us and, and rose again on the third day as you said you would. And we're thankful, Father, for your truth and your humbleness and your love. Father, help us to show that love in our lives with our families and with all those around us that you've told us that the greatest of the things is, is love. And, Father, we want to have that in our life and to uh, show love to other, other, other people. Father, we go through this service. Help us to be mindful of the things that uh, Scott teaches us this morning. Help us to take those things and try to find ways to put them in use in our lives and to remember those things when we struggle and to lean on, the, lean on your word and, and the lessons that we've learned that help us through the times that are rough and... Uh, Father, we know that you're there with us each step of the way. Help us, Father, to turn away from sin and to use those things to help us to help strengthen us and others. And that when they see us turn away from things that we know that we're, where we're tempted, that it will strengthen them as well. Father, we ask that those that you be with those of this number who are unable, unable to be here this morning, who are suffering for whatever reason, Father, whether it's loneliness or or illness or just the desire not to be here and to be at home, to do other things that they enjoy more. Father, we ask that you would prick their hearts and to, uh, or give them a portion of health that they need to be back with us again. Father, we ask that uh, you be with us through the rest of this life and help us remember that time is short and we only have a short time to get things right on this earth and that after that there's no, no, more, no more changing. Helps to change now and to do the things that we need to do to inherit eternal life as you've promised if we've been found faithful in Christ's name. Amen.
Certainly are happy to have our sisters that are with us. It's good to see Valerie back with us too. We're glad she's here and all the Sutherland family. We're in uh, the book of Habakkuk and Zephaniah today in our studies. And uh, I put four words up here uh, because these are four themes that through all the prophets that we've studied, these are things that recur again and again. Judgment, faith, repentance, and restoration. And we see these repeated in different words, maybe in different settings, but the same ideas recur again and again in all of the, all of the prophets and God's dealing with His people. And so I wanted you to think about something because this has been on my mind. The Bible says that God is the same today, you know, yesterday, and forever. So if God, if that's true of Him, and I believe it is, that He's always the same, then that means He is dealing no different today than He did back in the days of the time that we're reading about. For instance, today in the days of Habakkuk and Zephaniah. And so we need to learn from these things as the writer of Romans told us in Romans 15 verse 4, all these things were written before were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So, we're going to be looking at Habakkuk and Zephaniah, and uh, both of them are three chapters long. Uh, actually, probably Zephaniah was written before the book of Habakkuk, but we're going to take them in the order that we find them in the Scripture. Habakkuk comes first, and then uh, Zephaniah. Uh, the books of uh, Habakkuk and Zephaniah are written during the waning days of the kingdom of Judah. And the reforms of King Josiah and Judah were embraced by only a remnant of the people. The majority continued to worship the idols in addition to their worship of Jehovah. And there is a warning of the judgment of God on Judah and the nations around them, but there is also a ray of hope for the remnant who walk by faith and seek the Lord. And this remnant will trust the Lord and His promises no matter what circumstances around them may be. Habakkuk ministers uh, during the death throes of the nation of Judah. And although repeatedly called repentance, the nation stubbornly refuses to change her sinful ways. Habakkuk, knowing the heartache 
uh, hard-heartedness of his countrymen, asked God how long this intolerable, intolerable condition can continue. And God replies that the Babylonians will be his chastening rod upon the nation. An announcement that sends the prophet to his knees. And he acknowledges that the just in any generation live by faith, not by sight. And Habakkuk concludes by praising God's wisdom, even though he does not fully understand all of God's ways. The most likely date for the book is the early part of Jehoiakim's reign. Uh, Jehoiakim was a godless king who led the nation down the path of destruction. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's first invasion of Judah occurred in the first year when he deported 10,000 of Jerusalem's leaders to Babylon. And the nobles who oppressed and extorted from the poor were the first to be carried away. And since Habakkuk prophesied prior to the Babylonian invasion, uh, the probable date for his book is around 607 B.C. Uh, some of the keys to Habakkuk, the key word is the just shall live by faith. Uh, the circumstances of life sometimes appear to contradict God's revelation concerning His power and His purposes Habakkuk struggles in his faith when he sees men flagrantly violate God's law and distort justice on every level without fear of divine intervention. He wants to know why God allows this growing iniquity to go unpunished. And when God reveals His intention to use Babylon as His rod of judgment, Habakkuk is even more troubled because the, that nation is more corrupt than Judah. Uh, God's answer satisfies Habakkuk that he can trust him even in the worst of circumstances uh, because of his matchless wisdom, goodness, and power. And God's plan is perfect and nothing is big enough to stand in the way of its ultimate fulfillment. And in spite of appearances to the contrary, God is still on the throne as the Lord of history and the ruler of the nations. God may be slow to wrath, but all iniquity will be punished eventually. He is the worthiest object of faith, and the righteous man will trust in Him at all times. Then a couple of key verses. Uh, first one is Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. The, uh, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And then the end of the book, Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and He will make me walk on my high hills. And then the key chapter is the third chapter. Uh, the book of Habakkuk builds to this triumphant climax reached in the last three verses, uh, 17 through 19. And the beginning of the book and the ending stand in stark contrast. They go from mystery to certainty, from questioning to affirming, and from complaint, uh, complaint to confidence. Chapter 3 is one of the most majestic of all Scripture and records the glory of God in past history and in future history, that is, through prophecy. Uh, the Christ of Habakkuk. Uh, the word salvation appears three times in the book, twice in verse 13 and then once in verse 18. And it's the root word from which we get our uh, name Jesus, Jeho Jehoshua. Uh, Joshua is from the same root, the name Joshua. And so in uh, Matthew 1 and verse 21, the angel announces, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And Habakkuk in 2.14 says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then let's skip to Zephaniah quickly and we'll look at a little background on it and then we're going to make draw some lessons for ourselves from these two books. Uh, during Judah's uh, hectic political and religious history, reform comes from time to time. And Zephaniah's forceful prophecy may be a factor in the reform that occurs during Josiah's reign. A revival that produces outward change but does not fully remove the inward heart of corruption that characterizes the nation. Zephaniah hammers home his message repeatedly that the day of the Lord is coming when the malignancy of sin will be dealt with. Israel 
and her Gentile neighbors will soon experience the crushing hand of God's wrath. But after the chastening process is complete, blessing will come in the person of the Messiah who will be the cause for praise and singing. Zephaniah solves uh, the dating problem for us by fixing the day of his prophecy in the days of Josiah, the son of, king, uh, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Uh, Josiah reigned from 640 to 609, and chapter 2 and verse 13 in, indicates that the destruction of Nineveh, which occurred in 612, was still a future event. Uh, thus, Zephaniah's prophecy can be dated between 640 to 612 B.C. However, the sins cataloged in 1, 3 through 13 and 3, 1 through 7 indicate a date prior to Josiah's reforms when the sins uh, from the reign of Manasseh and Ammon uh, were still predominating. Uh, it is therefore likely that Zephaniah's ministry played a significant role in preparing Judah for the revivals that uh, took place during the reign of the nation's last righteous king. That was King Josiah. One of the key words, of course, in this book is the day of the Lord. Uh, Zephaniah discusses the day of the Lord and describes the coming day of judgment upon Judah and the nations. Uh, God is holy and must vindicate His righteousness by calling all the nations of the world into account before Him. The sovereign God will judge not only His own people, but also the whole world, and no one escapes from His authority and dominion. The day of the Lord will have universal impact. Uh, to some degree, that day has already come for Judah and all the nations mentioned in 2, 4 through 15. But there is also a day of the Lord, uh, a future aspect when the, all the earth will be judged. Zephaniah 3, 9 through 20 speaks of another side of the remnant who will survive and who will call upon Him. They will be blessed and God will regather and restore His people. And there will be worldwide rejoicing. Some of the keys to Zephaniah, uh, key verses, uh, chapter 1, 14 and 15. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There, are mighty, there the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And then Zephaniah 2 and verse 3. Uh, that we read, uh, Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth who have upheld His justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Of course, the key chapter is the third chapter. Uh, in this last chapter, Zephaniah records the two distinct parts of the day of the Lord, judgment and restoration. Following their captivity, Judah returns to Jerusalem and rebuilds the temple. And under the righteous rule of God, the Messiah will come and spiritual Israel will fully inherit the blessings contained in the biblical covenants. God's promise to Abraham will be fulfilled and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Uh, the Christ of Zephaniah. Uh, the Messiah is not specifically mentioned in Zephaniah, but it's clear that He is the one who will fulfill the great promises of chapter 3, 9 through 20. Uh, he will gather His people and reign in victory. Uh, he says, The Lord has taken away your judgment. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall uh, see disaster no more. And then we read in John 12 and verse 31, about the time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And of course, this is in the days of Christ that uh, John is referring to here. So in both of these books, they're both uh, directed toward the nation of Judah. It's in the last days of Judah. After the reforms of King Josiah, and then there are three of his sons that sit on the throne in those last days. And remember, uh, the Babylonian captivity actually took place in three, three uh, different waves. The first one in 597 B.C. and some of the others uh, are, are a little earlier than the last one in 597 B.C. So uh, there's about three or four lessons that I want us to uh, look at this morning. And the first one is this, why do the wicked prosper? 
You ever wondered about that? Probably you have posed that question, maybe in different wording. You know, it's been asked in many different ways. But we want to look, uh, first of all, at Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, where Habakkuk poses this question at the beginning of his book. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Uh, in verse 3 he says. So, you know, he talks about the deceit and the wickedness that's, all, that's abounding in Judah. It's not just in the other nations. He's talking about what's happening in his own country. And so he cries out, you know, Lord, how long are you going to allow this condition uh, to exist? We go on over to the second chapter, verses 1 through 4. And Habakkuk says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. So he's waiting for the Lord's answer. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just man shall live by his faith. And so, in these verses, we learn that the Lord is working things out according to His own plan and timing. You know, the question of Habakkuk is, Lord, how long? How long is this going to go on? And, you know, he's probably like a lot of us. He's impatient. He wants to see things. God says, well, write this, and then tell the man you give it to to run. It's going to be pretty soon. And to get the people ready. But He says... Here, the verse 4, and we're going to look at this again a little bit later. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just man shall live by his faith. I want us to read uh, Psalm 10. There's 18 verses in that psalm. Because this psalm addresses uh, uh, this uh, condition that we uh, read about here in the book of Habakkuk. Psalm 10, beginning at uh, verse 1. The psalmist said, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The same questions that Habakkuk had asked at the beginning of his book. The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. You know, there we read in Habakkuk, he said, you know, the proud are not upright in their ways. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above out of his sight. For all his enemies, uh, uh, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in lurking places of the villages and the secret places he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. He is said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He is said in his heart, you will not require an account. You ever wondered why some people act the way they do and say, I can't believe. How, how could they do that? How can they act like that? And the things he's describing here, how could people act like that? Well, 
he, he's answered this a couple of times in this passage. You know, he says that he thinks that God won't call it to account, that God won't, won't ask any accounting of it, and he thinks that God doesn't see, that God is not noticing. In verse 14, But you have seen, for you observe to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arms of the wicked and evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear. To do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. You know, I like what he says here. The Lord is king forever. The nations have perished out of his land. In other words, nations come and nations go. They come up, they go down. And the Bible tells us that God controls all of these things. And God is working things out according to his time frame and to his planning. But don't we sometimes wonder why is it that the wicked prosper? How is it that they seem to go along and nothing seems to touch them? Well, you know, the Habakkuk addresses this. We have to remember that the Lord is king forever and He will do justice. He will set things right uh, in, in His own time and according to His, His will. Well, one of the leading themes of Habakkuk was the just shall live by faith. And I want to look at a couple of New Testament passages that, uh, that quote from this uh, same verse, the just shall live by faith. First, in the book of Galatians, uh, the third chapter, Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Paul wrote to the Galatians, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And he's quoting from Habakkuk there. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You know, the law could not justify us because we couldn't keep it. You know, this is the point that's made. If there had been a law that could have been given that could have saved us, then salvation would have been by the law, but we could not keep the law because of our sinful nature. And so Jesus came to redeem us and to pay the penalty for our sin. He was without sin, you know, did no wrong. And yet as an innocent victim, uh, He gave His life in our place. And so He took our place on the cross. Uh, the blessings of Abraham then come upon all men through faith in Christ Jesus. And this theme, again, you find again and again throughout Scripture. And it always goes back there to Genesis 12 and verse 3. And you and in your seed, you know, in Christ, all nations of the world will be blessed. It never was God's intention to just pick out one nation and bless them to the exclusion of everyone else. But He picked that one nation to bring about the Christ so that all might be blessed in Him. You know, we read about the Jew and the Gentile in Paul's uh, letter to the Romans that they both are saved uh, through the Gospel. He said, For I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, as it is written, the just, shall live by faith. And there again we have this quotation uh, from the book of Habakkuk there in Romans uh, 1.17. Uh, let's turn over to the book of Hebrews now for a second. I want to read uh, Hebrews the 10th chapter 
Uh, verses 35 through uh, 39. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. You know, the order we always find in Scripture is this. We do God's will, and then we obtain the promise. You know, and that's what he talks about here, that after you've done the will of God, you may obtain the promise. But notice in verse 37, there is this idea again of this questioning sometime that we have when he says, for yet a little while, and then he who is coming will not tarry. In other words, I know sometimes you may be impatient. I know you think this is never going to happen, that things are never going to be set right. But what he's saying is, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. You have need of perseverance or endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may obtain the promise. So his encouragement here is, don't give up. Continue to the end. You know, continue. And so the just shall live by his faith. Then another idea that we have is seeking the Lord. And this was in our passage from Zephaniah this morning. But let's read again Zephaniah 2 verses 1 through 3. Zephaniah said, Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O uh, desirable nation. Before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld His justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. So in these few verses, we first of all, I think here, have a call to repentance. He is saying, you know, gather together before these things occur, before these things happen. And, uh, you know, he uses a couple of uh, metaphors here. He talks about the day passing like the chaff, you know, the husk on on a piece of grain that the wind just blows away. Or before the day comes when his fierce anger, you know, is unleashed upon the earth. So he's saying, you know, get together here and seek the Lord. You know, seek justice, seek humility, seek righteousness. So he's calling us here to repentance. We're reminded of a passage we find over in the book of Luke, in Luke the 13th chapter. And I want to read the uh, first nine verses there of Luke chapter 13. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18... fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you all will likewise perish. And so he spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. You know, one of the first things we made right with God because we think we're better than others. And this sometimes can be a real hobby of ours to criticize all of our neighbors and all those around us and think about how terrible they are. And so there were a couple of notable things that had happened. Uh, Pilate had mingled some 
of the blood of some of the worshipers at a certain time with their sacrifices, and another, you know, a tower in Siloam had fallen on a bunch of them. And so these were kind of current events these people knew about. And the Jewish idea was, well, if something like that happened to those people, they must have been terrible because, you know, that was God acting against them because of their sin. Jesus says, do you think they were terrible? Do you think they were worse than all sinners because these things happened to you? I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And so we're not made right with God by, because that we, we're better than some of those around us. Uh, we're all given you know, the same opportunity to repent. And uh, we need to take advantage of it. That's what the passage there in Zephaniah was about. Gather together before these things happen. You know, make some changes here. The other passage is over in the book of Acts, the uh, 17th chapter. And this is when Paul was in the city of Athens and spoke with the people there on Mars Hill. Remember at the beginning of this uh, sermon or speech that he made, he had looked at all the idol temples around and you know, he would said he noticed all these. He could tell they were a very religious people because of all their idols. But he said, I want to tell you about the unknown God. The God who is over all of these things. And so, toward the end of his uh, sermon here in verses 30 and 31, he said, And truly the times of this ignorance God winked at but now commands all men everywhere to repent because He hath appointed a day in the which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men in that He raised Him from the dead. You know, the ignorance that He was talking about there was the idol worship. And you know, we have a tendency to look at that and we, we read that and we know they had these shrines and these uh, false gods that they bowed down to. They might be made of wood. They might be made of stone. And we tend to kind of gloss over that and we think, well, <laughs> that's not me. But you know, when you read in the New Testament, we don't have to bow down to some kind of human form or some figure that we've made in order to have idols in our heart. We have our own idols. Anything, again, that we put in place of God or give first place before God in our life has become an idol for us. It's idolatry. And so he's saying the times of this kind of ignorance God has winked at, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent. And so we are called, just like in the days of Zephaniah and Abel,